recently got my hands on the Huawei P50 Pocket and I knew I had to make a video about it for two main reasons. First, it is obviously a foldable smartphone. I love those in general. But second, it is also the first major flagship smartphone that the company has brought outside of its home market of China in a major way for a very long time. So in this video, let's talk some first impressions about the phone itself and let's also discuss what it promises for the company's future more broadly. Right off the bat, this phone is a lot. It is just such an eccentric device. The gold color is way more muted IRL than I expected, so it looks a little bit between the pure silver and pure gold props that I have here. But aside from that, the 3D pattern on it feels so extra. The circles are a bold design choice. The phone also feels surprisingly heavy at 190 grams, and even the box itself is just such a statement. I don't think I'm the target audience of this gold finish in particular, but there is a more muted white version as well, and I love that Huawei went all out with it and even created an extravagant dress to go with it. The phone is a bit wider than the Flip, but pretty comfortable to hold because of the curved frame, and unlike the Flip, it folds perfectly flat. That's because this hinge has a kind of teardrop mechanism that we've seen on the Oppo Find N and previous Honor phones that kind of spaces the screen out inside at the gentle radius when folded up and creates a much less visible crease when unfolded. It's pretty neat. You can still see and feel the crease even at a slight angle, but not at all from up front. And its only real downside is that unlike Samsung's lid, this one often doesn't like to stay fixed at an angle. The screen is a nice high resolution OLED panel at 120Hz. It is beautiful, although it doesn't seem to have any variable refresh rate, so it is locked to 120Hz, which might not be the best for your battery life. In exchange, you do get a surprisingly big 4000 mAh battery with 40 watt wired charging, which is way better than Samsung has managed, so maybe this is just not an issue at all. Anyway, there is also an outer display that can show you notifications, a music and weather widget, and also allows you to use the main camera to take selfies, although this form factor seems a little bit more awkward than Samsung's bigger square screen. Then there's also expandable storage, a completely unexpected addition, especially on the foldable phone, though it uses Huawei's proprietary nano memory format instead of a standard micro SD slot. And finally, there are also speakers, which in my quick testing were just fine. Neither great nor terrible. So the form factor overall is well executed in my opinion. You get less of a crease, a much bigger battery, and faster charging, but there is no waterproofing unlike on Samsung's model, and the phone just feels a little bit wider and heavier. The basic white model will start at 1,300 euros, whereas the bling bling gold version will start at 1,500 euros. That is pretty expensive, especially given that the Z Flip can be had for less than 1,000 euros. But of course, the biggest question with any Huawei phone is what about the chip, what about the software, what about the cameras, and what about availability? So let's talk about those. Well, first the good news. Huawei didn't seem to have cheaped out on the cameras. You get two kind of normal sensors, a 40 megapixel main and a 13 megapixel ultra wide that can do macro shots. And then those are backed by a tiny UV light and a dedicated sensor that can capture that UV light, which lets you either create some fancy sparkling UV shots at night or apparently layer some extra details over regular photos. I've only had a very brief time with the device, so I couldn't quite give you a final opinion on the cameras yet, but on paper, they sound nice, even if a little bit gimmicky. The phone also comes with a bucket load of memory, as well as last year's Snapdragon 888, but without the 5G modems due to US sanctions, of course, and the day-to-day -day performance, as you would expect, seems fantastic. As a consumer who is perfectly happy with that same chip in my device right now, and as a consumer who can't be bothered to pay for a 5G plan even though my phone would theoretically support it, I think that is a perfectly reasonable chip setup. But of course, it doesn't sound particularly great for Huawei as a company. The P series historically launched around spring, meaning the P50 series is coming to market almost a full year too late here due to supply chain and policy issues when the next generation of phones from competitors are already getting released. And when I asked, Huawei's people were trying to convince me that actually 5G is totally not a big deal for consumers yet. Huawei, once the champion of 5G, had to say that. <laughs> Feels bad, man. I mean, as a consumer, I agree, and I think this chip is completely fine, but things don't get a lot easier when we move to software either. 
Huawei has already rolled out HarmonyOS on all of their compatible devices in China, including the P50 series, and meanwhile, everywhere else, the P50 series comes with EMUI 12, basically Huawei's standard Android skin that I think is based on Android 12, although that is hard to say because the references are actually hidden from the phone settings. When I asked Huawei, they basically said that HarmonyOS made a lot of sense for a consumer that had a lot of connected devices that would talk to each other using the HarmonyOS software layer, which seems to be the case in China, but not so much in Europe, so they basically decided against bringing that over here right now. And there's no real commitment in when or if they'll bring it over here at all, which is not at all what they communicated even just a couple of months ago. Just half a year ago, I made a full breakdown of Harmony OS that you can watch right here, prompted by Huawei, by the way, where the officially communicated plan was still very much that yes, it will be a rollout outside of China too, once they're done with rolling it out there, but that doesn't seem to be a certainty anymore. Also, the European press kit specifically shows some of the more advanced Harmony OS features, such as the one that's called Super Device, but on my review unit, that has been replaced by a simple Bluetooth device manager, basically and Harmony OS apps are not supposed to run on this phone either. In other words, this phone is basically just running Huawei's standard Android skin and it is not free of issues either. The skin looks okay, even if a little bit dated in my opinion. It is packed with features and also seems very responsive. There are a few elements like the compact folders that I kind of like and the iOS inspired control panel you will either love or hate. And all of the Google services have been replaced by Huawei ones, which are usually okay, but not quite on the same level as some of Google's offerings with a quick scroll around their map app, for example, giving me lots of results, but much less detail and worse navigation options, for example. And even if you're willing to live without Google services or are willing to get them through unofficial channels, there's still kind of an uncomfortable app situation here on the phone in general. Huawei has brought a bunch of app developers on board, including my payments app Revolut, for example, or cashless NFC payment provider Curve, for example, so you can tap to pay in Europe, but lots of stuff is still missing from the official app store. My browser, Firefox, my keyboard, Flexi, my password manager, LastPass, my food delivery app, Volt, and many more are just not in the App Store at all, while others such as my banking app N26 or Microsoft Outlook is only there as a progressive web app with limited functionality. You can of course use progressive web apps for a lot of things and you can also download APK files from the web or third-party app stores, which works technically in a lot of cases, but especially for things like my banking app, I wouldn't want to do it myself and I couldn't really recommend it to regular people in good faith either. And it's really quite disheartening that after many years of trying this is still a problem that Huawei pretty significantly faces today. While on the regular P50s, I would argue that that limitation alone should stir most people over to competitors instead, I feel like the P50 Pocket is such a unique piece of hardware that it almost has no competition right now and might therefore actually be worth your consideration anyway. If you want the bling, the full Huawei camera experience, the almost non-existent crease on the screen and the decently sized battery in this form factor, then hey, this is basically your only option right now. The price is pretty damn high and there are some serious compromises to consider here, but I feel like this might be the first Huawei flagship phone that is at least worth considering buying outside of China because of its unique hardware in a very long time. That is exciting and if you'd like me to make more videos about it, let me know down in the comments. All right, I don't have a proper sponsor this week, so just a quick reminder, if you want to support the channel and get something cool in return, then check out Nebula. I now have four full Nebula Originals, as well as five Nebula Plus segments up there exclusively, as well as ad-free access to all of my usual videos, and you can get an entire year's access for like 15 bucks with the CuriosityStream bundle that is linked down in the description. So check it out, and I'll see you in the next video.